through these slides, a lot of them real quick because some of them are probably redundant, but I'll just give you a little brief history. Uh, I go back with Audis even before then, when I was a banker a long time ago, I financed the cars for the Audi dealership. This goes back to 1975, I guess. That was my first evening with Audi. And then in 1980, 81, I did some driving for Bob Bondurant. We were demoing the Mercury Mercure TR4 SI double six nine or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the tracks at Green Valley Raceway, they brought out the Mercury, they brought out a BMW, they brought out an Audi Coupe, and they brought out a Saab. And we're demoing these cars. I'm sitting on the right passenger side. We're having somebody drive the car, and I've got my hand on the steering wheel. To, and I'm in the passenger seat. We're going around the racetrack. Anyway, we found out, my partner and I found out, that the Audi 4000 was the best car of all those cars. And we, my wife and I, we bought some Audis and, and uh, enough about that. But in 84, Joe Hoppin from Volkswagen Motorsports called me and said, Don, uh, John Schneider, who I had raced with in IMSA, uh, Hoppin talked John into buying a Quattro. They weren't selling very well at all. And Hoppin said, if you buy this car, I promise you something will happen and we'll do something with you with this car. So John bought it, and about six months later, Hoppin called me and said, would you put together John's Quattro for a 24-hour race at Mid-Ohio? <coughs> History of Volkswagen Motorsports. Audi, this before Audi hit the scene with Trans Am. So this particular car was Audi's first foray into racing, not rallying, but racing here in the United States. We did a car at Mid-Ohio. Jim Truman, who owned Red Roof, in, Red Roof Ends, was a co-driver with us right when he got cancer and, of course, died not long after, but he was uh, um, uh, Bobby Ray Hall's funder for Red Roof Ends on the racing. Schneider, myself, and Hoppin, we drove that car in Ohio. We, Audi sent us a camshaft and a roll cage <laughs> <laughs> to prep the car. That's all we got. Okay, I called Joe and you, he won't return your phone call. So we prepped the car, we put a cam in it, roll cage in it, stripped the interior somewhat, and we show up at the track. We do some testing and this is, uh, we got through maybe Wednesday or Thursday, we tested, and then Friday afternoon after everything's over, testing's over, qualifying's over, Joe Hoppin comes up, I'm sorry, this was Thursday, Joe Hoppin comes up and said, Don, anybody know Joe Hoppin? Okay, Don, real thick German accent. How are you? Well, we're fine, Joe. Well, Don, where are all the parts I sent you? Joe, you sent me a camshaft and roll cage. You didn't get wheels and brakes and this, this, that? No, Joe, we didn't. Oh, he gets on the phone. The next morning, a truck pulls up with 12 of the magnesium <laughs> rally wheels, a full suspension package, nice. a full brake package, you got to send some more. Go. and uh, a 935 boost knob. And so we scramble and start putting all the stuff on the car. Okay. And that shows what Audi Joe could do if he wanted to. It just said this was, that's just kind of the way he did things. Anyway, we got that car going, unfortunately, because the wastegate they gave us was shimmed a lot tighter than it needed to be, no test time. Uh, unfortunately, the motor detonated quite a bit. It lasted about an hour in a 24-hour race. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. A lot of work, and it didn't pan out very well at all. But then Audi came back and said, we like the idea of racing. They put together the Audi 200 Quattros for the Trans Am series, and of course, the rest is pretty well history with that. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to uh, <coughs> I was racing Porsches, and I raced in Grand Am with 944s, and we did MC GTU and a bunch of stuff. But uh, <coughs> when IMSA, I mean, a Grand Am, was coming up with their new series, and these may take a while to load, and I'm sorry for that, but I didn't have this <coughs> prepared with this particular show. Uh, bear with me just one second. Maybe you've got another. Well, let's see if we can do this. Anyway, we put together <coughs> an Audi S4 for Grand Am. Uh, actually, Motorola Cup, and it took me a couple of seasons to really develop that car because where, and this is in the year 2000, where do you go buy Audi race parts? Anybody know? Yeah. You don't. Yeah. You don't. You don't buy Audi race parts. So we had to take the S4, which is a, a 
great chassis car and develop everything. So I took the suspension and we took the control arms, we pressed out the rubber, pressed in spherical bearings, and I handmade pretty well the whole car. We built one car, raced at Sebring, raced at, um, I think one more race. Audi wanted to borrow it because Michael Galati's car was not ready for the new uh, SCCA World Challenge Series. They had one for Derek Bell, but not for Galati, so they borrowed my car, rented it from us basically. Michael Glotty gets in the car and on the first lap at Charlotte rolls the car. <laughs> totally. Totals our brand new race car. So Audi had insured us. We got a, a check for part of it. Then they sent us a brand new chassis, which is that car is made of the brand new chassis. Brand new S4 chassis in a huge wooden crate. Gorgeous. And this is why, this is how I learned a lot more about Audi's because the paint job on that car inside the car was just as good as the paint job on the outside of the car. And I've taken apart Mercedes and Porsches and built race cars before, but when you take the cars apart and you take the interior out, then you take the carpet out, and then you take the undercoating out that's underneath there, you can really see how they build the cars. With the Audi versus the Porsches and the Mercedes, everything is seam sealed real well. The paint job goes real far into the interior of the car. Maybe not the whole car may not be exactly like the outside, but quite a bit of it is. <laughs> but even the fasteners that they have to hold down the wire harness. Mercedes will take a sheet metal screw, run it through a little plastic discussion, and run it through the chassis. Drill it right in through the sheet metal of the car to hold the wire harness down. Audi will have these real nice metal pegs that they spot weld to the inside of the car, and there's like a, a, a threaded, and they'll hold a locking nut, screw that down, and put your wire harness, run it through that all the way through the car. Chuck, you've seen that. Mm -hmm. And that's how they hold the wire harness down. So they're starting with some of the basics, and they build up from there. The carpet on an Audi TT, if you look at the carpet on a TT versus the Porsche Cayman, the TT goes real far into the dash. It's stuffed real well throughout the, the whole inside of the car. It's just a much better built car than a Porsche Cayman. I see this car. Porsche Audi is my business. You drive a, a, a Boxster with a, 100,000 miles on it. My everyday street car is a TT with 195,000 miles on it, tight as a drum. A Boxster is going to rattle with 100,000 miles on it. And if somebody's driving Porsche out there, sorry about that. <laughs> my business too. But they rattle. And so when you see how these Audis are put together, they're, they're wonderful. Who drives an R8? Two people. I've been to the R8 factory, I was there in November. And I've been to the Porsche factory, been to the Mercedes factory. If you go down the assembly line, the building's R8s, and it's a real small area, they're pretty well hand-built. Now most cars are built by robots these days. They have two robot machines, and they're helping to weld on some pieces and then drill them for the exact position where the suspension bolts onto the chassis. And they've got a robot welding these little uh, fasteners that I was talking about in a couple of little spots. But other than that, the R8 is handmade. Hand welded and handmade. The pieces are formed there other than the doors. They're, they're formed there. Uh, the forgings are made at the site. And this is Nipposone. Cars are hand built. Amazing factory, totally clean. And here comes the assembly line with the B10 engine, which you might know where the engines are built. <coughs> Audi engines are built? Hungry, yeah. Built in York. Hungry. That's their factory. They build over a million engines a year for Volkswagen Audi. So the, the Audi V10 engines coming down this assembly line, they're going to take maybe every, I don't know, 50th off, let's just call it that, and move over to the side. And I said, why are they doing that? Well, that car is going to go down to the R8 LMS factory. That's going to be one of the cars, one of the race cars. So what does that tell you? The engine in the R8 LMS and the R8 Grand Am car is a stock factory V10 engine. Actually, detuned. And they're good enough in the race cars. They detune them from the street cars because they can't put out that much power on the track. The sanctioning bodies uh, regulate them. But your street engine is the same engine that's in the race cars. I think that's a pretty remarkable fact. They don't beef up the engine for racing because they don't need to. 
If anything, they detune it to bring the horsepower level down. So your engine in these R10, uh, uh, R8s with the V10, <coughs> is the same as in the race cars. I asked, I uh, can't remember his name, at the R8 LMS factory, how often do you go through these engines? And he said, we don't know. We've never had a problem. That car in the corner had 35,000 race kilometers on it. We've never touched it. That's, to me, that's unbelievable. This is three seasons on one of the engines. They, they, they've never touched it, never pulled the heads, never pulled the pan, or they've never done anything. That's how good these Audi engines are. Uh, anyway, so we raced S4s for uh, five years in the Grand Am Cup, and there were a total of, uh, and I'll flip through these real quick, because I have too many of them. We, we raced them for five years. There were five S4s that ran in Grand Am, and we either built them all, or they came back to my shop and we rebuilt them for the customer because we had S4s that nobody could touch on the racetrack. The Porsches couldn't touch us, the BMWs couldn't touch us. The only thing that could keep up with us a little on straight were the Firebirds with the big uh, uh, 400 cubic inch motors. They were pretty powerful, but on the corners, they, they weren't so hot. But we had uh, five years worth of work on these <coughs> S4s and uh, a lot of crashes. A lot of crashes and a lot of drivers. Uh, BAP in, in Canada sponsored us for a while. And like I said, I'll flip through these pretty quick. If anybody has questions, you can ask a question about them later on. But we uh, finished third in the championship in 2003. And the only reason we didn't win the championship is two races. Uh, we There's a little crash out there. Uh, two races. Ooh. Yeah, that kind of hurts. Actually, to tell you a quick story, at Montreblanc, Canada, we qualified 1-2 on the grid. <coughs> Anders Hayner was qualified on the pole, and Gary, I uh, can't remember his name, he's a Subaru driver, he qualified second. So race starts, and my second place driver pulled out in front of Anders and was leading the race. Well, Anders couldn't quite take that second lap of the race, he tried to pass. And why? I don't know. Why not just run? These are six-hour races. Just run 1-2. But he tried to pass the second place car, and that's the result. He crashed the car pretty heavy. Uh, anyway, every car that ran in Grand Am, we built or rebuilt it for Grand Am racing. Uh, the only reason we didn't win the championship in 2003 is uh, one, because of crash damage, somebody hitting us, knocked us off the track, and two, another race, we were leading the race, our transponder went out, and SCCA made us come in fit for a transponder, and where they'd made us put our transponder took us two laps to replace it and go back out. And those two races cost the championship. This is an example of parts that we built. You couldn't get adjustable front control arms, which you adjust your camera caster, so I made them. And then Stasis Engineering and a couple other teams would buy the links that I have, these pieces right here that I made, and buy them and use them on their control arms. But we came out with the adjustable uh, link control arms for the S4s, which is the same suspension that the a6 and the A8 uses today, they still use that upper link type suspension. So S4s, uh, loved racing the cars, uh, great motors, wonderful on the racetrack, uh, quite a bit different than racing the Porsches, I'll say that. Let me see if I can find up. Uh, so we raced those for five years. Pardon me while I come up with uh, the next batch. Then we uh, are racing Audi TTs. Let's see if that's TT. Yeah, that's TT. We raced those in SCCA club racing for a couple of seasons. And uh, we're pretty successful around here with the national scene. It just didn't have enough power. Of course, we're limited. Now, first off, all race series, we're limited with what we can do. All right, so somebody may have an Audi TT and say, well, you're only getting 275 horsepower, I get 350. Well, we are limited with what we do by rules. These are stock engines. S4, TT, any car we're, we're ready with stock engines. We maybe can do some turbo work or exhaust work, but we cannot necessarily change intake, intake runners, injectors, and so forth. So we have to go by what the rules are. That's our World Challenge car we ran at Grand Am. That car's for sale, by the way. Um, <laughs> We raced uh, 
That's in Canada. We raced uh, this particular car. We're running in World Challenge, uh, Grand Dam at Daytona. Got punted in the back, rolled that into a ball. Turned four at Daytona, hit the wall. Real heavy, one of the worst crashes I've ever seen. I wasn't driving, my co-driver was. Rolled that thing into a ball, but he got out and walked away from it. Um, Revo has been my sponsor for several years, Revo Software. APR sponsored me, MTM sponsored me, then Revo sponsored me. And not to get to any pitching matches, I think all of them, GIAC, APR, Revo, MTM, they're all good tuners. We have specific reasons we go with Revo, but I'm not knocking any, anybody out there because to me it's all a mystery anyway and my hat's off to anybody can decipher and determine that code and get it and take a car and get 30, horsepower, 30 to 100 horsepower more than the manufacturer decides to put out with a totally reliable engine, my hat's off to you. So we did TTs uh, for several seasons with the Mark 1 TT. This is at Long Beach since this last year. We finished sixth with that car. Um, so they're all purpose-built cars, totally gutted, cage, fire systems, and so forth. Uh, love racing the TTs. <coughs> uh, a lot of, a lot of cars, but we're going to go on to what we're doing now. And a lot of you have seen the uh, TTRS outside. Uh, but that's not a TTRS. <laughs> Let's see here. Pardon me. Okay. This gives you an idea of, even on the suspension, um, this is not on that car as one of the other cars we're building, but if you look at the where the arrow is here and here and here, all the rubber bushings are gone, and we made sleeves to press a spherical bearing into a sleeve and welded that sleeve to the control arm. And why do you do that? Well, some of you know, some of you don't. Suspension on all cars is rubber encapsulated to give you, uh, so you don't feel the road the same, because you don't want it. You don't want to feel what's really happening with your car. This isolates the suspension from the chassis, and so you have a nice smooth ride. Without it, you're going to feel every little in the undulation on the road, every little pebble that you go over, you're going to feel that. Also, it's going to be a lot noisier. On a race car, you don't mind that. You want that. You want feedback from what the suspension is doing. When you're going around the corner, you don't want to have the car swaying on the bushings. You want to have it precise, like a go kart. <coughs> you want it to be very precise. When you put the spherical bearings in this, that's what you get. You get a real positive feel with the car. Uh, that's my car coming off the trailer. The first, that's the first RS in the country. And I have to say, I want to thank Audi for holding off the introduction of the RS and letting, letting it go until I got the first car. And they did this on purpose, and I didn't know it at the time. But they held up delivery for two weeks to be sure I got the first car, because once they unloaded that car, they called me that day and said, will you go to a racetrack and let us come down from headquarters and film a video? We want to film a video of what's called Remarkable Audi, that you have the first Audi TTRS in the country. So uh, that was the first one that, that uh, it wasn't the first one in the country, but it was the first one that they let go to a dealership because they're holding the rest of them at the port. Okay, just delivery. <laughs> nice little deal. Okay, here's at Texas Motor Speedway from getting ready to film this video, which is a really nice little deal. Uh, camera crew from Dallas, and uh, I've done a lot of movie work, and so pretty familiar with what they do, a lot of stunt work and such. Uh, that's Brad Sturtz. Anybody know Brad Sturtz from Audi? He's corporate uh, communication director for Audi. That's him right there. Not his best shot, but that's him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Forge Intercooler <coughs> TTRS. The TTS, which is pretty well like the Volkswagen GTI, has a real large intercooler but it's large in dimensional size, but it's not very thick. The TTRS intercooler is thicker. This is the forge, which is about six inches thick, which means as the air goes through the vents, and some of you engineers know this, that air, instead of going over something that's large but having very small surface area to go over, this intercooler is a lot thicker, so the air is actually going to cool, allow the outside air to cool that charge more so, 
on that particular intercooler. So we'll be putting that on our car. There's the thickness of that uh, next week. Let's see, here's a copy of a shot of the rear front control arm with the spherical bearings. Now here's a quiz. Some of you may not see this right here. You see that? What's different about this and that? Can you tell by the picture? Is a quiz I have on, on my Facebook page. Nobody answered it because nobody knew. The stock bushing, and this is only for you tech heads. I don't expect you to know. I don't expect Rick to know. All right, this is the stock bushing, real large rubber bushing. If you put that on your car, you can take that thing and move it probably about a quarter of an inch at least back and forth. Well, this is the octagonal right here. So this spherical bearing is round. So I make a sleeve, this is aluminum sleeve that I make and press over the control arm to make it round, and then it'll slide right into my bushing that I make. So nobody knew my tech answer, but I wouldn't expect you to know that. So that's the stock control arm. You see the spherical bearing we make for that. Um, this honking exhaust is a mill tech downpipe, and this right here is about Gosh, it's about five inches. This is coming off the turbo on the TTRS. So that RS turbo exit is pretty good size. Comes down into a three inch neck right here going back for the exhaust that they're making. Another shot of the spherical bearings. Uh, this is a Coney race shock and I take the stock upper strut mount here. I put a billet of aluminum in it. I mill it to accept the spherical bearing at the front where it's got pivot, ability to pivot back and forth yet be a solid, uh, encapsulate the solid bushing with this. Um, show the picture on the car. You can see the spherical right here. We press into the upright. I think that's all for that. I just got a few more miscellaneous to show you. I was telling Rick, Went to Cabin or Audi on one of my trips to San Antonio, and I need to buy something at the dealership, so I bought this hat, and it says Cabin or Audi on the back of that hat. You can't see it there, but it says right, it actually says on the, I believe on the rim of the bill. That's my hat from Cabin or Audi I bought a couple years ago. This is an autograph session at one of the World Challenge races. Maybe all that I have. I thought I had a picture of the R8. When I was at the R8 uh, factory, <coughs> um, watching the R8 being built, it's just, it's just gorgeous. Um, I was fortunate to get a tour of the R8 LMS factory, which is about 10 kilometers away. And my tour guide at the R8 factory has been with Audi 27 years. He said, I don't know how you swung it, but you got a tour that nobody gets to go to. I've been here 27 years, I don't even get to go there. <laughs> So another kid, who's only been with Audi seven years, took me over there in an S3 and was really excited because he was going to get to go into the R8 LMS factory. So we went over there and that's where the car, they're prepping the car for the, the race. They just got back from Dachau, I think, where they won the race there. And over on one side, they're building a car and it was being striped with red, white, and blue. And it looked like a Texas flag, to be honest with you. Well, that was the car being prepped to come to Daytona test days back in December. So they were getting that car ready and I asked a lot of questions and they actually gave me answers, which I was kind of surprised. Um, and that's when they told me about the B10 engine. The B10 engine, they will restrict that engine for power and they may put a 47 or a 42 or a 51 or different uh, size restrictors into the intake and they don't have to reprogram it. They have their, their technology down so well, all they have to do, put the restrictor in the engine port, two different ports, turn the ignition on, start the car, and in 20 seconds, the computer has read the airflow at idle and readapted it for the whole RPM spectrum. You want to make another change? Fine. Shut the car up, put another restrictor in, start it back up, it adapts. 
So they can do a lot of testing to track without reprogramming that ECU. It's really remarkable. Anyway, so that R8 that they're prepping at the LMS factory, when I get to Daytona test days, I was invited, to, uh, I was a guest of Audi. <coughs> the car shows up at the Atlanta airport, they truck it down to uh, Daytona, and Brad, uh, Brad Kettler, who is the new director of Volkswagen, uh, Audi Motorsports here in the States, I get to the parking lot, the RH in the back of the parking lot of the Marriott, and they've got their little trailers there, and they're trying to get this car put up on the air jacks to work. I mean, it's just Brad and his truck driver and another guy. Audi technicians weren't even there yet. And so he's trying to get this car put up in the air. It had Chromtac air jacks, which would buy, make my stopley. And he's trying to put this, anybody know what I'm talking about? No. Air jacks on the car? You see a car pit stop, the car races up magically? Well, it's air jacks. He's trying to put this gun onto this of the car and it wouldn't work. And I get to look and I said, well, Brad, that's a Stobbly system on the car and this is a uh, some other system you're trying to work with that's not compatible. So Audi didn't send the right part. <coughs> anyway, I worked in the parking lot for two days getting the R8 ready for Daytona test days. It not, it's not that Audi didn't have it prepped to get on the track. They didn't have all the safety equipment on it that Grand Am mandated. So we had to put the window nets in, we had to change the shocks and rebound the shocks and a bunch of different stuff. And then we get to the track and uh, I've got videos when they unloaded the first R8 and pushed it out, took it to the pits area. Pretty exciting because this is new history, new technology for Audi to come to the United States to run a full race season for, for private teams. Audi's been here before. Now, Champion has run the R8 before, but Champion was heavily affiliated with Audi. But this is a new era for Audi to come for Audi Customer Service Motorsports to come and bring a division here in the United States. And what it tells me is they're finally recognizing some of the importance of the U.S. market, a la all the RS cars they're building now that will be coming to the United States. And instead of just the RS4, and the RS6, which were limited in years. Now we've got the TTRS. It will be coming out with the RS5, the RS4, the RS6, and they recognize the importance of the U.S. market. And part of it is up to us as Audi owners and drivers to convey back to Rick and convey back to, to Audi USA, we want these cars. And one way people know that they know that we want them is by talking to the dealer and saying, you or you, if you can get it, I'll order it. RS4, they've got several RS4 owners here. Wonderful car, dynamite car, and you know, that's the RS5, the new RS4, all these RS cars, they're built at the Quattro factory, not at the regular assembly line, and there's a lot of special things to them, but it, it helps with the breed. That RS4 that's sought after helps the S4 driver makes his car worth more money. You think about that. A lot of people can't quite afford the RS4, but they can buy an S4, which is not quite as much horsepower, but a lot of similarity. But I think it keeps the value up on the S4s when the RS4 is out there. Did the, did the TT sales jump up at the last part of the year? Absolutely. Yeah, why did they jump up? RS. Because the TT RS came out. So the TT sale <coughs> jumped up because the TT RS came out. And this is a fact. I mean, this is not me saying it. This is the fact that Audi has shown the TT sales jumped up. They were languishing. The TT RS came out, TT sales jump up. It's, it's a, you know, it's, as Rick knows, the whole deal about Audi, it's about selling cars. Now, they do it in a different way. Their factories, ultra modern, Ultra clean, ultra green. I mean, I've only been to one at Nicholson. Ultra green factory. They're very concerned about the environment. They're very concerned about it here. The gas mileage on cars are getting better and better. My RS, which is a 180 mile an hour car, I can get 32, 33 miles per gallon on the highway. And uh, R8 drivers, I don't know what you get from mileage, but their cars are getting better and better all the time. The technology is getting better, and Audi is investing not the millions, but the billions of dollars worldwide for technology. So I service Porsches and Audis. 
the car of my choice is is the Audi. I could have been driving the Cayman R or something else, but the TTRs is what I chose, and I have a long background with Audi, and I, it's interesting to see this as it's getting better and better, and the in our area, the number of Audis we see is three times as many as it was even two years ago. And so that's the way it's going worldwide. So racing out this has been very exciting for me. We'll be running that car tomorrow. I start stripping that car down, my TTRS, to race at World Challenge. <coughs> we go to St. Petersburg in, in March for the, the Honda Grand Prix. Then we go straight to Long Beach for the Toyota Long Beach Grand Prix. Then we go to Miller Motorsports in Utah. Uh, it'll be the Detroit Grand Prix in Detroit at Bell Island. We go to Mossport. We come back to Infineon in California, Laguna Seca in California, Mid Ohio, and uh, somewhere else. Now they may sneak a race in here at the new track in Austin, an unofficial race. We may be racing here later this year. Yes, Does that yes. series follow the ALMS series or a different one? Well, ALMS, uh, we will be we'll be racing with ALMS at I know at Long Beach. A couple of weekends. Yeah, that same weekend they'll have the. Uh, IndyCar race and the ALMA race and our ALMS race and our race at Long Beach. And I'm not sure if we're partnered with them. We'll be with NASCAR, we'll be at IndyCars, we'll be at ALMS, and we have some standalone. All our races are televised. They're live feed on the internet the day of the race. They'll be televised on in, uh, new NBC Sports, which I think they took over Versus, I believe. So they'll be televised on that. So. Uh, this car will be up against Camaros, Mustang 302s, the Cayman S, uh, the 370Z, and what they don't know, uh, what the they don't know is the Cayman S and what they do not know and i am not really going to tell them, but this car will be putting out about 430, 440 horsepower, and they're allowing me to bring the weight down to about 2,900 pounds, which is pretty good considering the other cars that have horsepower are up in the 3,000 plus pound range, and um, they've allowed me to put the four gender cooler on it, uh, a certain brake change, and of course, being four wheel drive, we'll see. Uh, in the rain, <laughs> not just the rain, <coughs> anything where it's damp at all, Quattro's, it, it's, it's unbelievable how good those cars will come out of the corner. So, watch for some world challenge. If you got any questions, I'll be around. Uh, I have a long history. We do special things with Audi, but as I meant to talk to Chuck, the training that your mechanic is going through at the local dealer, dealer level is outstanding. Audi has a brand new service center in Dallas, and it's state-of-the-art training. Um, they get as good as somebody can, and the information, the technology that they have available through the service centers help service your Audi, and nothing's perfect. We know, we know that. In cars, for Audi to compete with BMW and Mercedes, everything is stepping up a notch or two every year. Well, technology has to advance, which makes it really difficult. And I know you may complain about that little light going off, about this glitch here or there, but it's, it's, it's a competition. And everybody wants the best, and everybody's demanding things, like today. Who would buy a car today without power windows? Hardly anybody without power door locks. And basically remote, hardly anybody would buy that. Well, 20 years ago, that was only the upper level cars. Well, today, just almost every car has those features, and so it gets to be what else can come up next year. It makes it harder and harder. And I don't envy mechanics that have to deal with that. But the technology that they're training they're getting from Audi is top notch. Anyway, any questions for me? I said did a great job. <laughs> yes, sir. I got one. Uh, with the new uh, RS4 coming out, um, maybe you could help us out on that, but it's a, a debate that we've been quite having for a minute on the forum. Why did Audi go back to the V8 that came out with the 2007? On Why, the RS4? Yes. <coughs> on the Instead upcoming of the 3-liter? Why did not come up like BMW so coming out with twin-turbo V6? Mm -hmm. Why did they choose the V8 platform? Well, to V8 with, with just a non, a, a normally aspirated yeah. motor mm -hmm. over the three-liter turbo, which, by the way, that three-liter uh, turbo, I'm sorry, three-liter supercharged motor can put out easy 400 horsepower. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think our software puts it like 410 with just software change alone. You know, I, I don't have a specific answer for that, other than it could be as simple as a marketing 
idea. V8, the sound of the V8. I mean, the S4, great car, real good sound to it, but it doesn't have that sound that the V8 engine has. Now, another thing, because the RS5 has the V8 twin turbo, they may want that to be a little superior to the RS4. But I'm sure that a lot of it has to do with marketing because marketing is what's driving and selling cars. Performance is certainly a certain aspect of it, but if you can't market the car and if you want to compete with, if you want to compete with a BMW M3 has the V8, exactly. right. you know, well, it's an apples and apples yeah. thing, so that would be something I would think about. Now you can get more power out of that three liter supercharged car than you can out of that normally aspirated V8. And of course the V8 twin turbo, you can definitely get more power. But I have to look at the fact that maybe marketing. So you, so to follow that with the choice to go with the uh, twin clutch transmission on the RS5 would be something that's marketing rather yeah. than... Uh, an example, we race, we have two Volkswagen GTIs, 07 Mark 5 cars, we have DSG gearboxes, S-Tronic, the Audi. Anybody ever driven the S-Tronic on the racetrack? Not many? Dynamite. Our Volkswagens have the DSGs, and the reason we went with that, I was at Silverstone in England testing the BMW with the SGM transmission, and it's their clutchless transmission, and it's felt like, a, like an automatic shifting. Seat was there with their Cooper Leon race cars, and they were just running circles around us, which is a GTI made by Seat with the SG gearboxes. I talked to the engineers, how often do you have transmission problems? And they said, well, we don't. So I come back to the States, we buy three Volkswagens from Volkswagen Marketing with DSG gearboxes. We prep them for the track, we run them in World Challenge, we ran them in SCCA, love it. Paddle shift, those things shift just like that. And believe me, if the TTRS were to come with the S-Tronic, and I say DSG, S-Tronic, same thing, I would have bought that in a heartbeat. Love that transmission. Yes, sir? Yes, I can't hear. Um, that transmission on that car is available in Europe and has been. What was, was it again a marketing reason for bringing the marketing car? reasons? Well, bringing the well, the reason I talked to Mark Freuknight, who's a project manager for the RA and the TT here in the States, and he said it was a marketing decision because one, they would have to crash another car, and you know, and ruin another car to crash test, maybe more than one, to, to uh, cover their EPA DOT rules. Whatever car you bring in, you have to crash test it. So if they brought in the TT with the six-speed and the TT with the S-Tronic, they have to crash both those cars. And they didn't want to go through the expense. Their studies showed them that more people would prefer the manual transmission. Well, I'm only me. But I'm talking after coming from the TTS, which only has the S-Tronic, loved it, I would have bought the seven-speed S-Tronic on the TTRS in a heartbeat because it would have been a faster car. But their marketing said no, and they, they did otherwise. Well, it, it's a great shifting car, but personally for me, I would prefer the S-Tronic over the six-speed manual. And people say, how can you do that? I've been racing cars for 35 years, and that would be my preference. So Don, that TTRS that you have out there is the one that you're going to strip down and make into a race car. Yes. And so it has been your daily driver until now, or is as some, what? do you use it as a daily driver now, or not really? Uh, actually, no. I, I have another TT I drive every day, an earlier TT, and that one sets in the garage. I've put 2,500 miles on it since July of last year, and so I drive it occasionally. But Audi, let's just say couldn't, I won't use the words would, would not, but let's say they could not give me a TTRS for racing, so I'm committed to racing the TTRS through various sponsors, and so that car, like I said, tomorrow, I get back to the shop and that car gets stripped down for racing. I hate to do it, but that's what i got to do. But it'll be a dynamite car. Yes, Steve? Could you take the transmission out of your S and put it into the RS? What's that? Can you take the S-Tronic transmission out of your S and put it in the RS? The DSG out of it? Well, uh, theoretically, I guess you could take an S-Tronic out, put in that, but I don't know if the six-speed 
that they're putting in the TTS would hold up to as much torque as that car has. The TTS, uh, stock 265 horsepower, about 250 torque, with software about 310, about 310 torque. That S-Tronic transmission, DSG, is torque limited. And with software, it brings up, because the software will bring their torque back. So if you have a DSG car and you have software, the software in your DSG may be limiting your power. You put DSG software on it, that raises that limit. <clears throat> and I've been into the boxes. I don't know if it would handle the power, because we have probably 400 foot-pounds of torque right now on that car. And I don't know if it would handle it. And then you look at the fact <coughs> with the TTRS ECU handle and work with that. So I don't know if compatibility, so we're not going to go there. I'll let you come over and you can work with it. <laughs> you can do it. There's another question somewhere? <laughs> yes, sir. So your Facebook page is the TTRS build a race car? Did they? I, I, I saw something on Facebook yeah. that Audi, was. Audi has built what they call the TTRS race car. And I, they were building one when I was at the Audi ALMS factory. Most of you seen pictures, real wild flares, front and rear, real big wing. And that car is not legal for any racing here in the United States, any professional racing here in the United States. So it doesn't make, because they talked to me about bringing one over and why don't you buy our car. And this is one reason I think they're not supporting this specifically is because they want to sell their TTRs race car, but it's not legal. You cannot run it in Grand Am. You cannot run it in World Challenge. It's too radical of body work. You can run it in the amateur series, NASA, let's say, but there's no pro series. Uh, and so it's a dead horse at this point in time here in the United States. But the TTRS, they claim 385 horsepower the engineers at the factory kind of laugh at that figure said it has a lot more than that car. And it's a front wheel drive only car. Front wheel drive only. Don't get caught up on that because that black TT that you see, we converted that from a Quattro to a front wheel drive race car. And I tell you, if you get the right diff in the front, now, rain conditions a little different, but on the drive, you get the right diff and suspension set up, you can have more power at your wheels, at your front wheels, than you can all four wheels by running the front wheel drive. Okay? So it's quicker than it was as a Quattro, because we're driving two wheels instead of four, but we don't have that power loss. Turning, uh, turning 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and back and turning 90 degrees, 100, uh, 90 degrees again, we don't have the same power loss, so we converted it. We kind of found this by accident. We had the hall decks disconnected at, at uh, Lime Rock. <coughs> we didn't have time to connect it. We went out, and I thought, whoa, this car has more power. We picked up a little torque steer in the first gear going out on the track, but it was a great handling car and had more power. And so we got with the sanctioned body and said, hey, if we run this a front wheel drive car, can we take weight out of the car? So we pick up. We picked up more usable horsepower and got to drop 150 pounds of weight off the car. So it was a win-win deal. Yes, sir? I'm not sure if you covered this, but is it a capacity issue why you have to wait so long to get your cars? From Audi? Yeah. <laughs> 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 what we have, we actually have at, at our dealership, we have 70 plus percent of our allocations pre-sold right now. And that's pretty much what Audi is experiencing. So it is a supply, <coughs> demand supply issue. And uh, the typical is a 90 day period on the special order. Uh, if we put S-line packaging on cars, sometimes we delay, especially in the Q7 series. The Q7 is one of the slowest special orders that we have. Uh, and then slotting RS product right now, we have a couple of customers that are waiting to get TTRS. And those slots have not been awarded. We have, we actually have a slot for a demonstrator has not been awarded yet. So we just sit here and watch. We can't really tell people. There's, there's a real good answer to that. Audi is selling so well worldwide, okay? And they only have the Ingolstadt, Necrosome, uh in Spain to build a Q5 in Spain, and then the Hungry Plant to build the TTs those are their plans. 
And so they're building cars for the whole world, and the China market, and the, uh, uh, in Dubai, the Middle Eastern market has exploded so much, there's only so many cars they can build. And the U.S., yes, is a real strong market for them, but let's say the U.S. makes up maybe 15%, let's say, of production. Less than that. And yes. other countries collectively make 85%. So until they can determine, which is close, to building a U.S. plant, it's supply and demand. The U.S. is 10%, actually, of world okay. of worldwide. Worldwide, we say. And it is a, it's a good problem for Audi to have. It's a bad problem for us because it does take a while to order a car and get cars. And it's not that the dealer doesn't like you. <laughs> it's not that the dealer doesn't want to get your car as quick as possible, but it's like, it's not that we're a stepchild, but we're not main focus. The United States is not a main focus. It's getting stronger. And because of that fact, now they're discussing building, I've had discussions with the Brad Sturtz and uh, Scott Keel with Audi about a U.S. plant. In fact, the dealer, you may be involved with this too, about building a plant around the Alliance Airport area up in North Fort Worth because it's a great area for it. I don't think they will, but just an example about getting out into put a plant in the United States. Volkswagen is building a new plant in Tennessee, Chattanooga. Chattanooga. And so there's a possibility of, of spring-loading off of that for a new Audi USA plant. So it's a possibility. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, guys, let's enjoy the museum. It's